Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Uh, today we're going to continue with population dynamics um, and we're going to uh, move into a topic on how populations are regulated or how do we regulate population growth. <clears throat> so here you can see the world's birth rates. Um, so this is birth per 1,000 people, so per 1,000 individuals in the population. And you can see the different countries and, and where that, um, you know, comes out. Now again, we talked about this before, some places in China still have a child limit. And so they're going to be, you know, this uh, dark blue color. So we're looking at somewhere in that range of about 11 children for every 1,000 people. 11 births for every thousand people. United States, we, which we don't have a limit, uh, we're a little bit darker, so maybe 15, 14, 15 per 1,000, and then all the way up to some of the some of the African countries, um, you know, close to that 50 per 1,000 population. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways that you can regulate this. You can regulate this by putting laws in. You could potentially regulate this by educating people. Um, like I said before, there's really good documentation that the more educated individuals are, the less likely they are to overreproduce. Um, and then you could do this from another perspective of um, maybe there's just not enough resources or room um, to have high populations. And so you can see some countries, majority of Europe, which I don't want to say is crowded, but it's kind of crowded. Uh, you know, none of those countries are, are producing high levels of individuals. Now, all these countries are educated countries, and they're also developed countries. So there's probably that aspect going on also. <clears throat> so nonetheless, there are ways at which you can regulate it. You could re regulate it with laws. You could regulate it with education, you could regulate it um, by mandating birth control. So in India, it's not the case anymore, but in India um, in the 30s and 40s, uh, they regulated and they mandated birth control. So after a certain number of children, men were um, forced to uh, go through a vasectomy and um, and that was that was it. Um, so you know there are lots of ways to do this. Human issues um, are a little more difficult. We will talk about how populations regulate themselves, and uh, we we can talk about that from a human perspective also. So human populations can regulate themselves through diseases um, and whatnot to decrease population growth. And we'll talk about this. When we talk about disease outbreak and natural resources and, and whatnot. <clears throat> but first, let's just talk in general about some things that affect logistic growth. So remember, a logistic growth curve is that S-shaped growth curve. So it's going to have you know this increased rate of growth, and then it'll reach a carrying capacity at some point in time. Now, lo logistic growth is density dependent meaning that the rate of growth, so how fast of growth rate you have, so how many individuals you are adding to the population, is going to be directly related to the population's density and how close you're getting to carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity is definitely density dependent. So as a population approaches carrying capacity, and then the growth rate will have to decrease. And so this is going back to that growth rate equation where as n gets close to k, uh, the rate of increase decreases. And when n becomes the same as k, then the rate of increase should be 0. <clears throat> now, there are lots of density-dependent factors out there. Um, and we'll talk about some of these from a human perspective, but also other organisms. Um, and those things can be like disease outbreaks, it could be 
uh, starvation, uh, lack of water, so dying of thirst. It could be, um, so those are going to be physiological stresses like food and, and water and whatnot. Um, it could be, you know, increase in predation, lots of different things that are just going to be based on how many individuals are in their pop in that population. As that increases, the chances of disease outbreaks, the chances of physiological stress, chances of predation increases. <clears throat> so, in other words, density dependent factors intensify as the population size increases, for the most part. Now there are density independent factors also. These are factors that it doesn't make a difference how big the population is. These things can occur at any time um, to a small population or a large population. Those things can be things like drought, um, hurricanes, earthquakes, all kinds of things that can occur, fire that can occur that can destroy individuals. Um, so it can take lives but has really nothing to do with um, the density of the population. Now, I have to mention this with a caveat, though. We don't know the actual effect of the density um, on certain things. We know that it's true that as human populations increase in a given region, they increase the temperature. And as we lay more cement down in cities, we increase the temperature of that region. And when you have increase in temperature in regions that have certain air flows, you increase, have the tendency to increase the likelihood of a tornado. So the density of humans in certain regions could affect tornadoes. We have really good evidence that um, by fracking and, and drilling in certain regions, you can cause miniature earthquakes. Now, there's, to my knowledge, there's never been a large earthquake caused by fracking or, or drilling, but small earthquakes have been caused by it. And um, so <clears throat> whether or not that's enough to cause a major disturbance or habitat destruction, that's unclear. Many of you could probably point to, you know, many examples where you have an increase in number of individuals that visit a certain region, a camp that camp in a forest or something like that. You increase the chance of fire. Um, so there's lots of density independent factors that density might actually play a role in it. Now, how severe it is or how much damage and things like that, that probably has nothing to do with the density. But the likelihood of it occurring could have something to do with the density. And, you know, there's limited evidence on some of these, but nonetheless, there is some evidence to support them. All right, so that takes me to another related topic, and that's how are we going to classify different types of species when it comes to the rate at which they can grow. So we do this by two kind of categories. We put some species in what we call R selected species, which means they have a high reproductive rate and they have a high mortality. And often they'll have no parental care. And so it's normally just put as many eggs, as many offspring out in the environment. A lot of them are going to die. Um, but some will survive. That's kind of our selected species. Versus a K-selected species, which is going to be have very few offspring. Those offspring are going to grow very slowly and going to have a lot of parental care, a lot of energy put into a single offspring, and they might live for a lot longer. So these are really kind of two uh, two ways at which species can reproduce. Now, there are other species that occur kind of in the middle. Um, so it's like a 
it's a R slash K species. Um, so not quite either one, but uh, in, we'll look at some distinct features of R and K species on the next slide. And you probably could come up with some species that kind of fit the bill for each one. So R selected species, I'll just go through a couple of these. Again, they often have really short life. They mature really young. There's lots of them. Uh, which means that they can pioneer new environments. They often are generalists, so they'll feed kind of on anything. They often are examples of prey, and they tend to be low on the trophic level. So photosynthetic organisms are often kind of in this R-selected species. K-selected species, they got long life. Um, they mature late in life. They tend to adapt to stable environments so they're not those pioneer species they come later in life they tend to be niche specialists so they you know occupy a given region at a given time and specialize on it and have evolved and adapted to that uh, mostly predators or all almost all the predators are case species and they uh, can, tend to be high on the trophic level so there are lots of other features that can come in, but there's many organisms that are part K, part R. Um, it's just a way that we can classify what kind of reproductive strategies are they using. Okay. Now those reproductive strategies can um, indeed affect growth rate. So if you remember when we were looking at growth rate equations, we were looking at logistic and exponential growth rate, we used the the term R or the you know the letter R to represent growth rate. How many offspring or what's the potential for the population? Well that R was not a true R. The true R is taking these things into effect. So B which stands for birth rate plus I which stands for immigration and then you need to subtract off the death rate and the immigration. So how many organisms are dying and how many are leaving the population. So let's look at that. Again, the births is a number of organisms um, that are new organisms coming into the population at a given time. The immigration is the number of organisms that move into the population from another population. The deaths or again the mortality, the number of individuals that died during a given time. And immigration is the number of organisms that move out of the population during a given time. So if your time frame is a year, then you know you're looking at these along, you know, within a year. But if you're talking like maybe mosquitoes and we're talking about them breeding in a month. Maybe you're looking at death rates, immigration, and immigration, um, all within one month. Okay. And so these are, it just depends on the time frame that you're looking at, on where, how you would calculate birth and immigration, these kind of different rates. All right, so that kind of brings me to another piece where that death piece comes in. And that has to do with the maximum lifespan of a species. And lots of different organisms have different lifespans. Right? And so a lifespan is, um, well, it can be, can be a couple things. So it can be represented as the oldest that an individual has ever been documented. That's kind of a, a poor representation of lifespan. So often we just take what's the average that this organism will last. So the average lifespan of say like a male human in a developed country is somewhere around 75 years old. Okay. The average lifespan of a female is somewhere around 78, 79. Okay. Now the maximum lifespan though, the maximum life of uh, a human. I think the oldest human ever was 122 or something around that range. Um, so <clears throat> that's the maximum potential 
but the average is, is far less than that. So there are lots of situations, though, where we have organisms that um, can live for a long, long time. Bristlecone pines are the, lo the longest living creature on the planet that we know of. And, you know, some of them are, you know, 4,000 plus years old. Um, the oldest ever documented bristlecone pine was found by a name, uh, a name of a geologist slash um, botanist, so kind of both, uh, named Donald Curry in 1964. And I'm going to show you a little bristlecone pine video, but first I want to tell you this story about Donald Curry because Donald Curry, his story is sad, but it's also good for science, or it was was good for science at the time. So Donald Curry was a grad student at North University of North Carolina, and he studied botany and was interested in uh, ages of trees. And so he came out to Nevada and studied bristlecone pines in Nevada and was aging a tree, a bit bristlecone pine. Um, and to do that, I kind of have a piece of equipment here that you can see. This is called a tree borer, or sometimes called tree core. And so if you see, if you can see this little tip right here, this um, is going to be inserted into the tree. It's, it's ground into the tree, and it's hollow. And then you would just pull the core out. So the core is going to be on this little tray. And I don't have a core with me, but I'll show you how this is done um, in a video later. But you pull the core out and then you count the rings. Most of you have counted rings of trees before in elementary school. Well, this is a way, this tree bore is a way that you can do that without killing the organism. So you, you, you grind, you know, you twist it in, take a core sample, you take a plug out of it, you, you can, you know, age the tree, and then you pull your borer back out and it's just got a little hole in it. Sometimes people like to, you know, just putty over it real quick so no diseases and things get in. Some people will just take the, the core after they've read it and push it right back into the tree. Um, but the tree itself will often excrete um, a large amount of sap out that hole and protect itself. But the tree's alive. Now here's how the story goes with Donald Curry. In 64 he is um, checking out a tree uh, and it's right now it's known as the oldest tree um, ever detected, or the oldest organism ever detected. So he was coring the tree and using a core probably much larger than this to get um, into it, but coring the tree, and I guess the story goes as his core got stuck in the tree and he couldn't get it out. Um, so the park ranger at the time decided, hey, why don't we just cut the tree down, get your core out. And they did. They cut the tree down. And the tree, I think, is called Prometheus. I think. Don't quote me on that. I think, I'm pretty sure it's called Prometheus. But now. Um, and uh, they cut the tree down and got his core back. But then, to his surprise and the park ranger's surprise and pretty much everyone's surprise, they started counting the rings on the tree, the growth, the annual eye on the tree, and it ended up being over 5,000 years old, that tree was. And so that would have been the longest um, living organism that we have documentation of. Now, you can still go see bristlecone pines um, in Nevada and California um, and Utah. And, you know, some of these are ancient trees, um, you know. Uh, well over 4,000 years old. And so, um, interesting trees. And I'm going to show you a little video on them right now, and, uh, and then we'll talk more about lifespans. High above the normal tree line, clenched against the eastern limit of California, dwell the ancient bristlecone pines, the oldest living creatures on Earth. 
Many of these ancient trees were seedlings when the pyramids were built, mature trees by the time of Christ. Most of this extremely dense wood, what we can actually see, is dead. It's a superstructure, not unlike a coral that supports and protects the thin ribbon of life within. The oldest of these trees are more than 4,700 years old. They thrive today despite intimidating odds. A wild, prophetic force of nature, they are survivors. Their stories have much to teach us about change. Okay, so there you can see the bristle cone pine. I mean, it's tough for people to think about, but we're, you know, we're in the year 2018. And, you know, majority of the bristle cone pines that you can find are 2,000 older, 2,000 years older than that. And in fact, when we look at, um, you know, when we look at the life that humans have been on the planet or, you know, how long humans have been on the planet, some of these bristlecone pines are like, well, you know, they're the children of trees that were here before humans were. Um, so, you know, it's pretty impressive to think about that. Uh, I mean, given that humans have been around, maybe grandchildren, humans have been around um, about 20,000 years or so. Years. So in modern form, about 20,000 years. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of these organisms, 5,000 years old, uh, and... Uh, still in the landscape and I mean that's pretty impressive humans you know up to 120 like I said I think 122 is the maximum ever recorded and then if we're talking about things like microbes like bacteria or archaea or things like that you know some of them only live for a couple hours and so the maximum lifespan for organisms can be very different so that difference in maximum life span can be projected on curves, which we call survivorship curves. And there are three general survivorship curves, or three general patterns that we see in nature. Now, again, like I said before, some organisms fit these patterns perfectly, but then some organisms are, you know, a little bit of both patterns. And it just depends on the environment. It depends on, you know, what food's available, you know, how many predators are around, what's the, you know, what's the water situation like. Lo lots of things can determine these survivorship curves. So one is, this is typically, typ typically called survivorship curve number one, <clears throat> which is a full physiological lifespan if the organism survives childhood. So as long as the organism survives childhood, they have a pretty full lifespan. So elephants, bears, humans, you know, lots of organisms, um, mainly mammals, big mammals, uh, fit this kind of perspective. But that being said, some sharks will fit this um, perspective also and uh, you know uh, other organisms that might have just a couple offspring that have to make it once they make it they live a very long lifespan the second curve which is called survivorship curve 2 um, is the death is really unrelated to the age so not that you have consistent death rates but you're just as likely as a juvenile or a child to die than you are as a middle-aged individual than you are kind of as an older individual. Now, eventually, you'll reach your maximum, and then death is inevitable. But, you know, things, most birds fit this. Um, you know, other small mammals will fit this. 
there's a few fish that fit this probability. Amphibians and reptiles will fit this. Then you have things like mortality peaks early in life. So where you might have organisms that massive reproduce and they produce tons of organisms and then only a few survive. But once they survive, then their life, I mean, they're going to live until they reach close to their maximum. Uh, insects are this way, fish, most plant species produce way more offspring than ever going to um, take hold. And so th these are kind of the three general patterns. And so here you can see those curves. So A is, you know, survive juvenile, and then you got a long life, and then you'll crash when you get close to your maximum. C is, you know, lots of individuals are going to die early on, but then after that small period, you're going to have relative low death rate until you meet your maximum. And then B is really unrelated to the age. It's equal opportunity of death as you move through life. Right. <clears throat> so what factors can regulate population growth? There's quite a few factors, but some that we're going to cover are intrinsic factors. These are factors that are between organisms of the same species. So you could have competition for food, mates, uh, habitat, shelter, water, lots of things that would fit in the intrinsic factor. Right? Extrinsic is from outside the population. This could be predators, this could be you know, climate, uh, the, a lack of food, um, a few other things that you know that can affect the population from outside. Biotic factors are factors that are caused by living organisms and most of the time it's a density dependent thing. So if we're talking about diseases and parasites and predation, um, these are all density dependent. So as you increase the number of bunnies on the landscape, you increase the number of predators on the landscape. As you increase the number of people in a classroom, you increase the chances that they're going to pass um, that you know, virus from one individual to the next, or you know, that bacteria from one individual to the next. These are density dependent factors. Okay. Abiotic factors. So abiotic factors are non-living factors that, again, they can decrease the density of the population, but really have nothing to do with how many individuals are in the population. So, you know, a drought, uh, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, fire, these are all often um, called density independent, although some might be density dependent. Okay? <clears throat> but they're definitely abiotic factors. These are factors that are not living right, and they can decrease the number of the individuals or cause habitat destruction. So abiotic factors can alter the biotic factors which then can have an extrinsic or intrinsic factor or effect on a population. So these don't all happen in a closed bubble or in a system where there's no interaction. Abiotic factors can change the biotic factors, which then can have an effect on a population. That happens all the time. Okay. <clears throat> so density dependent factors, um, normally what's going on is you're going to get a reduction in the population size by either decreasing you know, how many offspring are born or how many offspring make it or um, increasing the mortality after they do make it. So there's lots of situations. And you can have what we call interspecific interactions. That's between species. So things like predator-prey oscillations. So here's an example of that. This is a classic example of um, populations of the Canadian lynx. 
and the snowshoe hare. You can see here in red snowshoe hare populations. As the snowshoe hare population increases, the Canadian lynx follow. And then once the, the lynx peaks, then the hare is going to crash. And then the hare will bounce back up. And, and like I said before, you can see this line is just staggered. It's at the back end of the peak. Typically, it's at the back end of the peak or right at the peak. And that's causing you know, one population to decline while the other po population is inclining. And then it will decline um, because there's no prey. So lynx will follow the hare collapse. Lynx population collapse will follow the hare population collapse. So <clears throat> then there's intraspecific interactions. And so these are within a population. And most of you probably know, you know, some interspecific interactions. We live in populations right now, there's competition for resources. I mean, whatever the next great toy to come out. Um, wait for the lines at, at the different, you know, department stores, Walmart or Kmart or Target. Um, whoever's got that toy, there's massive competition for that. And that's, that's an object that your life's not dependent on. Let's say water was a limited resource. Um, the interactions would be vicious um, because I mean, we have interactions over, like, toys that are vicious. Um, say food is a, a limited resource, um, you know, those interactions are, are going to become very, very heavy in competition with high levels of mortality because individuals are trying to survive. And that really has to do with approaching that carrying capacity. So as a population density approaches the carrying capacity, whether that be food, shelter, water, whatever it might be, and that resource becomes limited, you're going to have an increase in competition. You're going to have an increase in interactions. You're going to have an increase in physical encounters with all organisms. And so the more the resource becomes limited, the more interaction, interspecific interaction you should expect. And, I mean, most of you have probably seen this. I mean, literally, uh, the toy example is the classic example. Whatever the next toy is, the second it hits the shelf, people are grabbing four or five of them, selling, selling them on eBay. Um, you know, people are stealing them from other people's carts. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. But that resource is limited. There's only a few out. Um, these kind of things. Um, other ways at which this can occur is when that resource might be um, access to shelter, access to food, or access to water. Um, so organisms will often control the territory around um, a, like a water hole or around a good food source or around a good shelter, and they'll set up ter territorialities and they'll fight for that territory. It might also be access to females. Males always fight for access to females in lots of organisms. And so it depends on what the resource is and how it's limited. But as you approach that carrying capacity, you're going to have a higher level of interactions. And most of those interactions are going to tend to be fairly violent um, as the resource becomes more limited. Along with that, you can get things that where you get interspecific interactions due to limited resources or something like that. And then you can get this outside um, effect from other organisms. You can get you know, parasites coming in and, and affecting organisms or diseases coming in and affecting organisms. Um, and so you can get these... Uh, outside effects coming in, but it's all due to the interspecific interaction. It's due to this competition for resources that can increase the the rate of disease. Okay, so with that, the next thing we're going to talk about is how, as 
natural resource managers, environmental scientists, ecologists, how do we go about conserving what we have without you know putting it all in a bubble or putting it in a zoo and, and just allowing people to look how do we go about conservation more than preservation and so we're going to talk about that next time